This is the Hori D-Pad Joy-Con controller. It's a controller that came out and the idea is to replace your other Joy-Con that has these buttons that I always seem to refer to as C buttons because they remind me of the N64 C button. So hearing me say C buttons, that's why. The idea was to replace it because Nintendo opted to, of course, go with separate buttons rather than a D-pad, as the idea for the Switch was that you would always have two controllers at the ready, and they decided to have to sacrifice the D-pad. Now, you may have heard a lot of people talk about this as a critical thing, and a lot of that has to do with Nintendo's history. If you go back to 1985, the Nintendo comes out, we have that, and Mario, and they introduced a cross button configuration that was essentially the D-pad. And from there, we've always known it and we've loved it for things like platformers and fighters. And now here's a company that pretty much brought it to the mainstream that opted to get rid of it in their default configuration. In fact, they're the only ones that don't have a D-pad that comes with their system when you buy it. Instead, you have to buy a pro controller that's $70. But what if you don't wanna spend $70? Well, right now, you can either reshell your Joy-Con or you can buy this. And today we're gonna to talk about this thing. We're gonna open it up, we're gonna check out the insides, and I'm pretty much gonna tell you why it's almost, like it's almost worth the money. First, let's take a look around the Joy-Con. This one, I actually like the way it looks a lot. It's this interesting, smoky, black, gray, ghost-looking uh, plastic with, of course, Zelda-themed designs pretty much all the way around it, and that's great. It's a good way to help sell it, and I like the way it looks a lot. Now, the way it feels, is actually okay as well, except they did have to do one weird thing on the back where there's a bump where the Joy-Con release button is, which is weird because that kind of messes up the flow of certain grips that you would use. I noticed the Satisfy grip had a bit of an issue with that one when it was sitting there, so that's kind of a problem. Otherwise though, the Joy-Con itself, the shell, the molding they used is very close, like extremely close to the original. So the look, the feel, it's all there, it feels pretty good, except for the weight. See, this Joy-Con has nothing to it. And when I say nothing, I mean nothing. We're talking like, we'll talk about a controller that has NFC, it doesn't, it doesn't have NFC, it doesn't have rumble, right? That's fine to a degree. This one doesn't even have a battery. It has no way to even communicate to the system unless it's attached to the system like this. And that actually brings up a lot of problems. You see, the idea of the Switch is its versatility, the ability to turn into multiple controllers if you need it, or the ability to take the controller off when in docked mode or when in tabletop mode as you see it here. This is a handheld only device. In fact, on the box, they even say that it's for handheld mode only. It's right on the front. I have a feeling that has a lot to do with confusion, from the uh, customers or whoever's walking in. This is a $25 controller that only works in one mode and that is definitely an issue. Now we'll come back to that in a minute. First, I wanna say the D-pad on this controller is good. It's more of a traditional D-pad than what we have with even a reshelled Joy-Con controller. I've reshelled a few Joy-Con controllers and despite the D-pad being there, it's still a tactile click. So when you move around, you can still tell that there are buttons underneath of all of the directions and you can still pretty much push all directions at the same time anyway. This is more of a rubber membrane design that does not have that clickiness to it. So it's not like how if you have a 3DS, you can kind of go and, and the older ones would have like a click for the D-pad. This does not have that. This is closer to the Pro Controller, although looking at this D-pad, I think this D-pad is better than that Pro Controller because it's hard to hit all four buttons and directions on this one. Whereas that's something that they seem to be working through in the background with Pro Controller, right? Where you can push it all at once. They're kind of making it so you can't quite do that as much now. This is the best D-pad alternative currently on the market, especially if you want it in handheld mode, because otherwise you have to travel with either a Joy-Con that you reshelled that never quite feels just right ever again, or you gotta travel with a Pro Controller, and well, that's not very convenient. Now the pricing on this controller is $25, and that is about half the price of a single one, and then of course significantly less than buying a double pack of the Joy-Con controllers, significantly less than a Pro Controller, which is roughly $70 to $75, depending on the, the model you get. If you get a special edition one, it's usually a couple bucks more, like the Xenoblade controller was about $75. This is $25. It says it comes out October 2nd, but it seems to just be in stores now. So if you really want this, you can go out seemingly and get it now. I actually walked into a local GameStop, 
picked it right up. It didn't have like a register lock or anything on it. That was good to go. Heard people get it from Target as well. So just go, I guess, to your local big box store, see if they have it or go to GameStop and it's probably out on the shelf. Otherwise, Amazon seems to be shipping these October 2nd, and I will leave a link in the description so you can check out more details about this at your leisure. Anyway, back to the one issue that, that I had with this Joy-Con, and it's not even the weight. See, I thought the weight would be a problem when I heard that it had nothing in it. It's literally a bare bones Joy-Con shell with a D-pad and a circuit board just so it all works together. It is lighter, but in handheld mode, I didn't notice it. It wasn't like it was unbalanced when I was playing it, and that's fine when you have it off of the off of the, the system, it's very light. But here's the thing, it doesn't work off of the system at all. I've tried several different things. I, I People were saying, try it on the charge grip, try it on the charge grip. Nothing. It, do, it just doesn't work. It doesn't have a battery, doesn't have any communication. It needs to be completely attached for it to work. So, think about it this way. If you're traveling with your Switch and you do not bring a left Joy-Con because you know you're going to be doing a lot of fighting games and you're using this one, well, you're always going to be holding onto the switch. There's never gonna be a moment where you put it down on, say, on a plane you have that, the table that comes down. You're never gonna do that because this doesn't work off of it in tabletop mode. You're never gonna use it in dock mode, which I guess if you're bringing your dock, you might as well bring all of your Joy-Cons and, you know, <laughs> a pro controller and whatnot. But this significantly damages the versatility of the switch. If you're taking it with you, you're only holding it and it's only in handheld mode. And that's a little odd to me. See, this was a great opportunity to pretty much give people a reason to not have to buy the Pro Controller. H Hori could have made this thing 30 to $35 with a battery and a way just to wirelessly communicate, and it's still worth it compared to, say, the Pro Controller at $70. Because a lot of people buy the Pro Controller for the D-pad. That's seriously one of the biggest reasons people buy the Pro Controller, because it's the only way to officially get a D-pad from Nintendo. This is a good D-pad, but it, it, it doesn't make as much sense to buy it because it, it doesn't work off of the Switch. This was a great way, as people do like to play docked. For example, we just had the Spawncast. Sean tells me he doesn't have a Pro Controller because he likes the setup of the grip with the two Joy-Con controllers. So if it would work, that would be awesome, and that would make a lot of sense for him to just sit them both in the grip and play. Back to that D-pad, let's talk about that a little bit, because that is probably the biggest part about this controller, and it works well. I played several different ga games. I played the Mega Man Legacy Collection, the X Legacy Collection, worked great. Played Dragon Ball Fighters. it was significantly easier to pull off rolls and, and combos and everything with it. It was just an overall good experience with this D-pad, and that's a good thing because even the Switch's Pro Controller does struggle at times with that D-pad hitting weird button pushes and whatnot. This one is just, it's just a better experience overall when you're actually handling the different directions. Specifically in fighting games, I think platformers can still get away with these weird buttons here, and even the Pro Controller, but man, fighting games is like a whole nother world with this D-pad. The other buttons on there are so, so, the, the stick, the Joy-Con stick on this one feels very similar to this one, but the weird thing is that minus button. It's not tactile, it's very rubbery, it feels weird, and there's a lot of travel to that, and then the snapshot button at the bottom. All of it is just like this rubbery, cheap feeling, it's, it just doesn't feel very good. I don't know why Hori went with that rather than a tactile solution, but that's what they went with. I guess because they didn't have tactile buttons for their D-pad, essentially. They just went with rubberized buttons for the, the minus and the screen capture. I guess that's just what they wanted to do in design. All right, guys, now let's go ahead and kick this thing apart and take a look inside. It is very light. I do, like I said, I like the design. It looks really cool. But it is very, very light. This is the bump here that I'm talking about with that. That kind of messes up some of the grip configurations. Not a lot on the back. Couple Phillips head screws. Let's get these guys out here and we'll crack it open. Okay, so we have it open. It's using a, an interesting looking um, black circuit board and you can see where it connects. That's one of the screws. You can see where it connects here to there. That's that Joy-Con rail that is literally there just for communication and of course some power to make this whole thing work. Now the good news about this controller at the time when it came out, it would suck battery life like crazy, which probably has a lot to do with its compatibility with the older firmware. However, with firmware 6.0.0, they seem to have fixed the battery drain issue. For example, when I leave this plugged in now, 
maybe over the course of a day, a couple percent comes off. Basically, it's normal. It's not like how it was where it was sucking battery life by 10 to 20% throughout the day. So you don't have to worry about that too much now. Let's go ahead and unplug this, uh, this ribbon cable here, and we can pretty much separate this from that. And the other thing that I hear a lot of people question is, can you just switch the Joy-Con and actually put in like a battery and everything else? Unfortunately not, this is different. This is a different shell, different uh, screw hole mounts and everything, so it doesn't work out. And even if you could, and let's say you could put that other board in here, the problem is those are still tactile buttons, whereas this is using more of a soft rubber membrane. In fact, how about we take this motherboard out and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So we have the board out now, and uh, you can see the D-pad here. It's nothing fancy for the black plastic, but you can see the very large spike in the middle there where it actually uh, will keep it from trying to press all of them. You can see how deep that is right there, that, that spike. So yes, it's not, it's not easy to press all the buttons. You can actually see how, it, how offset it is there, where it will kind of lean to one side. So yeah, that, that is a big help and that, that is good to see. And that's why I was saying this felt good because you, can't, you just can't push all directions down at once. So good job to Hori on that. It's actually a good D-pad. Uh, joystick, pretty straight up, nothing crazy there. Ru again, rubber push for the, the minus, the thing I, I really don't like that much. And the joystick is pretty straightforward. It's nothing fancy, but it does do a pretty good job with the feel. So it does feel like the Joy-Con controller that we have in the standard first party one. So here is our, there's our button for the capture. Again, rubber membrane. They just use a membrane for that too. But this is the actual D-pad membrane here. And yes, that's what it's using. It's using similar to what you see in like uh, Nintendo, uh, even the Pro Controller, except it doesn't seem to have those weird presses, which I think a lot of it has to do with that spike that sits against that guy. It's much deeper than the Pro Controller one. So yes, this is just a straight up rubber push membrane on the contacts and it works well. I have to give them credit, it is a good feel. Those have some pretty good travel to them as well. So you don't get those weird button presses like you do as much with the Pro Controller. So if you want um, like a, a solid D-pad, this seems to be a good way to go about it. They definitely put some time into this D-pad and you can kind of see it all there. So this is, this is a well-built device. They just didn't go that extra mile for all the extra features like, you know, a battery. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the Hori D-Pad Left Joy-Con controller. I like the D-Pad. I like the look. I even like the feel of this thing. But there's so many issues when it comes to versatility with this. And I feel like they came up just a little short. A battery, wireless communication, and you have a controller that is easily worth $35 to $40, as it essentially makes it so you don't have to buy a Pro Controller. And it's still cheaper than a single one of these at 10 to $15, just doesn't have rumble and NFC technology. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure why they don't do that. I would like to see that from Hori if they come back to the table and they bring one of these with wireless communication, not even for it to be a second player, because let's face it, the D-pad, even with the shell one I have, not a good experience with that, right? It's just not. But to have it so that you could take both off at a moment's notice and play, you know, separate Joy-Con, because I know that a lot of people like to do that, or you have it in the grip, and then all of a sudden, you have what is essentially a pro controller at your fingertips. They're so close, and I'd like to see them release one that's, that's at the finish line with wireless communication, a battery. $30 to $35, I think is fair, 40's pushing it, but if they can do that, they would have a very compelling piece of hardware. So, if you really care about the Joy-Con controller being wireless at a moment's notice, pass on this one and wait to see if Hori comes out with a better one. Or Nintendo, please, 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 please come out with a first party left Joy-Con that has a D-pad. We all want it. Thanks guys for watching. I hope this helped you out with this Joy-Con controller review. I hope this gave you an idea as to why it's almost worth it. Or maybe in your mind, it's completely worth it because you just wanted to hear that the D-pad's good. And it is. Thanks guys for watching. Make sure you hit the like button if you liked it and helped it out for you. Dislike it if not. And I'll see you guys in the next video.